Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. We want to talk to you about limit laws. These are good to use if you're starting to evaluate limits algebraically and analytically, not just from a graph. So let's say that we have two different functions and we approach the same value x equals a on both of these. As long as both of these limits exist, then we can use these limit laws to make it easier to calculate limits. So here this is saying as we approach x equals a on both the function f of x and g of x, if we have add or subtract between these two limits, that's the same as saying we can take the limit in general as x approaches a of just adding or subtracting the functions. This is a nice fancy way of just basically saying that we can evaluate limits one term at a time and then just add or subtract the terms, whatever we get from plugging into each term. If I look at an example here, the limit as x approaches two of six x minus x cubed. Now x equals 2 is a nice well-behaved place on this function. There's no weird holes or asymptotes or anything strange going on here. So what we can say is this is going to be the same as the limit as x approaches 2 of the term 6x minus the limit as x approaches 2 of the term x cubed and because nothing weird happens with these terms at x equals 2, we can simply plug in 2 and we'll get 6 times 2 is 12 for the first one, minus 2 cubed for the second one gives us 8, and we'll get a limit of 4 for this one. For the second one, if we take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3x minus 1, that's going to be the same as the limit as x approaches 2, of x squared plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x minus the limit as x approaches 2 of 1. And again for this one we don't get any weird behavior from any of these terms at x equals 2, no divide by zeros, no undefined, no strange infinite things. So if we just plug in here the limit of x squared as x approaches 2 is 4 plus the limit of 3x as x approaches 2 would be 6. For this last one here, what's the limit as x approaches 2 of a 1? This is saying the function is 1 everywhere. There's not even a place to plug in an x value. So this limit is just 1, of course. And when we get 4 plus 6 minus 1, that will give us an overall limit value of 9 for this. So for this next rule here, the limit as x approaches a of some constant multiple of a function, that's going to be equal to the constant multiple times the limit of the regular function. This statement just basically says that we can factor out a constant multiple before we evaluate a limit. We just want to make sure that we don't forget to then multiply by that constant multiple we factored out at the end when we're finding our limit. Let's look at an example here. I have the limit as x approaches 3 of 8x cubed minus 4x squared plus 20x. Nothing weird going on with any of these terms at x equals 3. They're all nice and well-behaved terms. What I could go ahead and do is notice that they all are divisible by 4. Now I can't pull out an x. x is not a constant. x is a variable. So we don't just want to say the greatest common factor has an x in it and pull out an x. We can only do this with constants. So what we'll do is we'll pull out the constant multiple that is in common. We'll pull out the 4 and we'll say that that's going to be the same as 4 times the limit as x approaches 3 of what we have left, which is going to be 2x cubed minus x squared plus 5x. Now what you might be able to tell that this allows us to maybe not deal with some numbers that are quite as large all the way through the problem when we factor out this 4. So 4 times this limit. So 4 times, let's see what we get from each term, plugging in 3. 3 cubed would be 27, and then multiplied by 2, that would be 54. Minus, when we plug in 3 here, 3 squared is going to be 9. And then plugging in 3 to the last one, 5 times 3 would be 15, so we get plus 15. And then 4 times that limit, which we have here, so 54 minus 9 would be 45, plus 15 would be 60, so we'll get 4 times 60. And our limit here, it's a little more manageable. When we pulled out the 4, we get 240 in the end. So we have another limit law that basically says if I have the limit as x approaches a of two functions multiplied together, then that's going to be the same as finding each limit separately and multiplying them. So in other words, when we have a product 
In our limit, we can evaluate by just simply taking the limit of each piece and multiplying those answers together. Again, as long as x is approaching the same value for both of these. Looking here, if I have the limit as x approaches 2 of 6x minus x cubed times x squared plus 3x minus 1, what we don't want to have to do probably is distribute all this out and then plug in. So what we might just simply do is look at the limit as x approaches 2 of 6x minus x cubed, and then we'll multiply that by the limit that we get as x approaches 2 of this x squared plus 3x minus 1. Now you can plug in again and figure out what these are. I think if you'll remember, I did this already. This limit was a limit of 4. And this limit I also did in the video. This limit was 9 here. So we should get an overall limit of 36. So instead of having to distribute, we can just find the limit of one times the limit of the other, and that gives us an easier way to do the answer. We can do a similar thing with quotients. We do want to be careful when we have division that obviously we don't want the bottom limit to be zero because we can't say a number divided by zero and get an answer here. And it's not necessarily going to be the same thing as this anyway. So I have my same functions here. I have the limit as x approaches 2 of 6x minus x cubed over x squared plus 3x minus 1. So we will think of this as the limit as x approaches 2 of the top function, which is 6x minus x cubed. And on the bottom, we will think of this as the limit separately as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3x minus 1. And these we already did, right? We already did this limit, and this limit is 4, and this limit on the bottom is 9, and so we get a limit of 4 over 9. If this limit had been 0 on the bottom, again, we wouldn't be able to do this method. We can do a similar thing with powers. We want to make sure, though, that we remember something like a square root is also considered a power. The square root is the one-half power of something. And remember when we take square roots of things or actually any even indexed root, then it's possible we're taking, you know, an even root of a negative, which is undefined. So we just want to be real careful with that. Uh, but this is saying if you have a power of some function and you want to take the limit, you could just take the limit and then take the power. So since square root is really a power, let's take the limit of this thing and then take the square root of it, right? So this is saying really I could figure out what's the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3x minus 1, and that's going to be the same if I just then take the square root of what I get from the limit of what's inside. So if I do that, remember we already did this one, this limit is 9, so we actually get the square root of 9, and since 9 is positive and everything is okay with the square root of 9, then we'll just get a value of 3 here for this limit. So the big moral of the story, really, is that limits obey arithmetic. We mean add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Of course, obviously, a couple of things. The limits need to exist if we're doing these methods. We need to have no divide by zero if we're doing divide with limits. Uh, powers, we want to make sure that we're either using positive powers or being aware that we have some sort of even root, uh, square root, fourth root, sixth root, etc., and that those types of roots of negative numbers may be undefined. So we just want to be careful with some of these special cases that might pop up from time to time. Let's do just a couple more examples where maybe we already know the values for limits of functions at a particular x value. So here I know the limit as x approaches 1 of this function is 3, and the limit as x approaches 1 of this other function is 12. Can I evaluate these easily? So if I look at the first one here, limit as x approaches 1 of my function f cubed, that's going to be the same, remember, as taking the limit of f and then cubing it. So since I know my limit of f as I approach 1 is 3, then this would be the same as 3 cubed, and we can simply apply the power to the limit and get an answer of 27 there. If I look over here, the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared times g of x, so I have a product here, I can think of this as the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared times the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. Now, we already know the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is 12, so this part is 12 here. And what's the limit of x squared as x approaches 1? Well, if I just plug in 1, 1 squared would give me 
1 here, right? So 1 times 12, we're still going to have a limit of 12 for this one. Looking back down here, the limit as x approaches 1 of 2 divided by g of x. Well, my bottom limit is not 0, so now I'm safe to use the limit law of just calculating these separately. There's nothing to plug into 2 here, so this limit is just going to be 2 divided by the limit we have for g of x at x equals 1, which is 12. So 2 over 12 is going to give us a reduced answer of 1 sixth here. For this one, we have a couple of rules. I have a constant multiple rule and I have a subtraction rule. So I can just evaluate these one term at a time. Now five times this function and taking the limit is the same as taking five times just the limit of the function. So the limit of f at one is going to be three. So this is really going to be five times three minus the limit of g of x at one is 12. So we can just do this simple arithmetic here. We get 15 minus 12, and that will give us a limit of 3. Okay, hopefully these limit laws, add, subtract, multiply, divide, using powers will help you do some of these more algebraic limits a bit more easily. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.